Hello, good evening. Uh, Ash from London, back again with another album ranking. Now, this is a band that I was planning to do uh, quite a while ago, at the very beginning, really, and mainly to get it out of the way because it's a band that uh, everyone knows about. Everyone knows all the albums, they know all about the story of the band. Um, I'm talking about Led Zeppelin, of course. Uh, they're one of the well, probably the biggest band of the seventies, and uh, while I, while I was at school, there was one of the bands that everyone was into. Strangely enough, though, I wasn't early on. It was um, funny; I didn't really get into them until a bit later, till about seventy five, seventy six. So um, I don't know why. I just uh, I was very aware of them. Heard them. Everyone seemed to have the albums, but I never, for some reason, I just never really got into them that that, that early. Um, later on, I got into them in a big way. And I um, have a lot of friends who are big fans of Led Zeppelin, so um, this is for them, I suppose. Um, now, um, there have been a lot of rankings of their albums over the years, and um, so I, th I thought, well, gosh, everyone everyone knows the albums, there's always these articles. I, I thought I'd make it a little bit more interesting by also talking about the 2015 um, remasters that came out, there, which were really, really good. They were really well put together, well thought out, well produced. Quality products they were. Anyway, so a little bit about Zep. Uh, those two people out there that don't know them, <laughs> formed in uh, 1968 in in London. Uh, formed by Jimmy Page, who um, was originally a, a much sought after session guitarist around the uh, around the London studios in the 60s with many many people. Uh, who ended up a member of the Yardbirds, who were one of the premier blues rock and blues bands of the 60s and um, towards well, 1967, 68 he ended up as the only member of the band left and the band kind of like all just dis dispersed and he ended up the only member left and uh, in charge of the Yardbirds name as well so he had to re quickly reassemble a band uh, to just to fulfil some con con contractual um, obligations of concerts and things and so um, he brought in John Paul Jones on bass who also plays keyboards who was also from the session uh, musician uh, scene, and then the two young guys from the Midlands, Robert Plant on vocals and John Bonham on um, on drums, and they called themselves the New Yardbirds and went off to complete this gig. I think we were in Scandinavia, and uh, then when they uh, when they finished that, they decided to rethink um, under the uh, the managerial prowess of uh, Peter Grant. And uh, changed the name from New Year Burst to Led Zeppelin, and uh, that was it. Went and changed rock and roll <laughs> from from that period onward. Really, um, they uh, ultra famous um, even without releasing hit singles, particularly in the UK. They didn't release any singles in the UK. That was a big. That was a plan from the start. So it was all their um, their reputation was based on albums and live appearances, concerts, and stuff. And um, yeah, they're slightly controversial. They are uh, one of those bands that kind of like uh, they live that hedonistic lifestyle. Lots of uh, hotel shenanigans and groupies and all kinds of going on, goings on. Um, they also got into a lot of uh, trouble for um, nicking songs off of other people, particularly old blues songs, um, which a lot of people did. Uh, I saw an interview with Eric Clapton a few years ago, and he was saying, "Yeah, yeah, we all nicked." A bit of a solo from here, a tune from there, a song from there, but we always gave them credit. Well, Led Zeppelin had this, had this uh, knack of not crediting the original writers a lot of the time. So a lot of um, court cases have happened over the years and things have been sorted out, usually, but um, some of them haven't. Um, but anyway, I'll mention those as I go through. So anyway, Led Zeppelin, this is... Um, this is their um, their ranking. Of course, oh yeah, of course they finished in 1980 after the death of John Bonham. Uh, he was only young in his 30s. Can't remember exactly how old, but um, that was very very sudden and very sad. And they just, had, they just didn't carry on. They've re reformed a few times since with uh, John Bonham's son Jason on drums, most notably at the O2 Arena. Uh, was that 2007? I think it was. Um, uh, it was released on the, the live album called Celebration Day. Uh, but yeah, so. They just split in 1980, and that was it. So, okay, right. I will crack on. There's nine albums here to rank, so um, I'm going to start off from uh, least favourite to favourite. Okay, um, number nine. It isn't technically a studio album, but it's kind of always it's been considered a studio album in more recent years, and it was also included in the uh, 2015 remaster, so I'm going to count it. But it's number nine anyway, and it's uh, Coda, released in 1982. 
which was a compilation of outtakes, uh, mostly from In Through the Outdoor, which is the, their last studio album proper. And uh, it was a, two years after the band split, it was a slight disappointment. There wasn't really a great deal to get excited about. Uh, well, um, even the, the album sleeve is a bit boring. That was a hypnosis sleeve as well, would you believe? Um, it's a, an interesting photograph on the back there, the centre spread. There's just a little collage of um, photos of Zepp over the years, but um, well, it's, well, it's embossed, so that's something. But um, yeah, actually, interestingly, this was the last sleeve hypnosis ever produced. Um, they folded the um, design studio after this. Storm Thorgerson went on by himself to do lots of um, um, album sleeves in, um, uh, in the years to come, um, including with Led Zeppelin, lots of the uh, re releases and remasters he worked on. But yeah, that was the last one. But yeah, this was a bit disappointing. It's got only got eight tracks on it. <laughs> uh, We're gonna groove, which um, was taken from a live concert they did at the Albert Hall. Uh, I think it was in 1970, uh, with the the audience mixed out the mix. Uh, the The whole concert was actually uh, eventually released on the DVD that came out uh, years later, which is really good actually. It's a really good show that. Then you got Poor Tom, which is an outtake from Led Zeppelin Three. I Can't Quit You Babe, which is uh, taken during the sound check, I think, or a rehearsal for the Albert Hall concert that the first track was on. And then Walter's Walk, closes side one, which is an outtake from House of the Holy. Then on side two, you've got three outtakes from In Through the Outdoor, which are not really that great. And then this track called Bonzo's Montreux, which is basically just a drum solo, recorded in Montreux in 1980, no, sorry, 1976. Um, which is again, you know, it's on there because of it was Bonzo's death. It was a tribute to him, but it was not really. I mean, I've heard it a few times, but it's not. It was actually when um, when Led Zeppelin re released a box set called Led Zeppelin uh, a few years later. It was actually on there, and then mixed in with uh, Moby Dick, his other famous um, drum solo track. So um, yeah, but so like I say, yeah. Bit of a disappointment, bit of a yeah. You know, I mean, they have they have redeemed themselves years later with lots more in interesting uh, outtakes and stuff that have been released. But it was a bit, a bit, um, yeah, a bit dull. But uh, very sad as well. Very sad to uh, for it to be the last of Zepp album. But uh, yeah, nineteen eighty two. Now the uh, two thousand eighteen remaster from that. So uh, they've lovingly recreated the, <laughs> the sleeve there, still embossed. And, and all the remasters, the reverse of the sleeve is, has always been a, re, um, a negative version of the front. A bit boring on this one, but on some of the other ones it does look quite interesting. Uh, now, the other bizarre thing about this one, this one, this was an, originally an outtakes album, and it has two extra discs of outtakes. <laughs> so you've got outtakes of outtakes. Uh, some of them are actually quite interesting. Some of them are outtakes from previous um, previous sessions. Not, there's a original spread recreated then it folds out again and that's some more nice the shot of the band on their last tour in 1980 somewhere in the world or well, somewhere in Europe actually that'll be because they only, only managed to get to a tour of Europe but uh, yeah the, the extra discs are, are quite interesting there's outtakes of, of the um, I think I think there's little uh, slip case, uh, notes in here somewhere and dig them out yeah here we go now in here it's got the details of what's what I think. Oh, that's a, that's a normal track listing on that page. Should have got, should have prepared all this, shouldn't I? Oh, here we go. Right, that me my glasses for this. Oh, here we go. Yeah, we have um. Yeah, things like when the levee breaks, an alternate version of when the levee breaks. Uh, Bonds has another version of Bonds, Husband different version of uh, instrumental version of Poor Tom. Now, Sugar Mama, which is an interesting one, that's been around for a, a while uh, in boot, bootleg form, so that's an old blues standard. Uh, I think Fleetwood Mac and Taste have also recorded versions of that. The Baby Come On Home, which was originally a B side or something. Some of these did end up on later on, on, on other box sets and things. But there's another um, on previously unreleased track here called, uh, where is it? St. Tristan's Sword. It's a rough mix, uh, but that's quite interesting. Then the track called Desire, which is kind of like the, an early mix of the Wonton song, which is one of, one of my favourite Zep tracks from later. But, uh, that was from 1974, 75. But, um, anyway, so, yeah, an uh, interesting um, remaster of remasters. <laughs> oh, so outtakes of outtakes, not remasters. Remasters of outtakes and outtakes of outtakes of remasters. Uh, Coda, that's number nine in my uh, Led Zeppelin rundown here. Get all my words all over the place today. 
Okay, so, right, number eight. We're into the proper studio albums now. So, um mentioned it before. Uh, number eight in my um, Led Zeppelin rundown is The Answer of the Outdoor, which was our last studio album, 1979. Uh, if anyone saw my um, album sleeves video, you would remember this uh, from that. I was talking about it to great length on there, so if you want to find out more about that, I suggest you check out that video. Uh, hypnosis sleeve again. And uh, very, very uh, well put together. But yeah, this was um, very much... Ooh, I was looking forward to this because their previous album, the studio album, was um, three years before. 76 was their previous studio album. So obviously they had a lot of um, issues with... Well, not issues, a lot of sadness in the band, like the death of um, Robert Plant's son. And then there was um, a few legal issues going on. They had some trouble with some of the gigs in, in the States on their last American tour in 1977. So there's a lot of things going down. I think uh, Jimmy Page has some drug problems. So this was kind of like, it was, oh, I don't know, it was a lot, very much delayed because uh, they, were, they were making a big stage comeback in 1979 at Nebworth, Nebworth Festival, which I went to, which is uh, very, very exciting. And uh, this album was supposed to be out before that, but then got getting pushed back, so it ended up coming out after. So um, most people's... Um, First hearing of any of the tracks of this were at those gigs. They did they did three warm up gigs in Denmark and then played Nebworth and they played two tracks of this in the evening, which is the track that opens the album, and Hot Dog, which is um kind of a rockabilly song, which is neither here nor there, so it's kind of okay. Borderline novelty, I'd say. <coughs> but the that's one thing that this does um doesn't do very well, is it's I don't know, it's just, there's too many styles involved. You start off with, you start, I mean, In the Evening is a great track, actually. I must tell you, that's a good classic Zep track. Quite epic, I used to say. Uh, then you've got um, tracks like, uh, what you got? Um, Hot Dog Rockabilly. You've got Fool in the Rain, which is like a samba kind of sound. Uh, and then there's, um, what's the second The second track of this? I can't remember the, um, I've not played it for ages. <laughs> Where are we? Oh, I thought we'd track this in the first one. Oh, there we go, yeah. Uh, Southbound Suarez, which is a bit of a piano-driven kind of boogie beat on there. And then you've got uh, Side 2, it opens up with Carousel Ambra, which is apparently their longest song. Uh, and then All My Love, which is a tribute to um, Page's um, late son. And then I'm Gonna Crawl, which is the classic Zep Blues song at the end. Uh, but yeah, it's a little bit like Luster. I don't think Page was too involved with a lot of it. So it's very um, John Paul Jones uh, heavy. He's um, he's credited on um, quite a lot of the, uh, in fact, probably all the tracks actually, I think. On most of them, anyway, and it's very, very keyboard heavy. Particularly Carousel Ambra. Carousel Ambra is very much John Paul Jones's track. It's very proggy almost uh, in parts, although a bit late for prog, night 79, really. It's kind of like on the way out. But uh, yeah, all in all, slightly disappointed. We could tell they were struggling a bit creatively. Um, they feel like they'd lost their mojo. Um, they were still great live when they, when they eventually got to see them live in, in the same year. It's the only time I've seen the band live. I've seen. Um, Robert Plant solo a few times, and Page has turned up at a few gigs that I've been to. But um, uh, yeah, it was a yeah, not a memorable album, but um, yeah, not bad. I'll, I'll say it is. I think with Louis Zeppelin, you tend to set the bar a bit too high. Um, now, for uh, in my um, uh, album sleeve um, video, I mentioned it came coming in a brown paper bag, and that's how it that's how it looked originally in the LP. <clears throat> I didn't keep the bag, so I kind of should have kept it, I suppose, when I, when I got the vinyl all those years ago, because I got it when it came out. Um, and then, so it's just, it actually looks like a bootleg, or how the bootlegs used to look in the early days. Uh, the extra disc on here, you've got um, the booklets, and it just comes in, uh, wasn't a gatefold, of course, the uh, original on the vinyl. You've got some more shots from around the bar. Um, that's another one there, which is um, not the reverse of the the reverse side of the, the one I've got on vinyl. Uh, another one there with the there's the black and white. Oh, I see the negative version. But uh, yeah, this the um, you got you got the remastered album and the set the second disc. Um, oops, didn't get it in. There's um, just a different mix of the whole album. You got um, different tracks, different um, outtakes of the whole album in in, in running the same running order. So. Uh, that's that's that for the the extra tracks on there, the extra disc rather. So number eight in my um, Led Zeppelin uh, album ranking is Into the Outdoor from '79. Right, number seven. Now this is another album that suffers from too many genres, trying to mix in too many styles. 
Uh, it was one of the first Zepp albums I actually ever heard. It came out in 1973, and it's House of the Holy, which is uh, very, very popular. I mean, this is one, uh, about half the tracks on this became part of their, uh, the bulk of their stage show for a long time. I mean, when I saw them, they were still doing them quite a lot off this. Um, but yeah, I don't know, it's just one of those albums I never really fell in love with. Uh, it is pretty good in part when it, it's got some great tracks on it but some not so great at the same time really um, the infamous uh, hypnosis uh, sleeve there so it's a bit, bit tatted I have had quite a while even though I didn't get into them that early but uh, the photograph there taken on um, Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland the inside it's uh, I'm not quite sure what the inner shot is it that might be Tintagula somewhere I'm not quite sure I've never researched that bit We've got some kind of like weird sacrifice going on. It's all very uh, mysterious and uh, whatever. But um, yeah, actually, I've gone to a bit of trouble with this sleeve. You know, these naked children running up the um, running, running up the causeway there. So it, it ended up coming in um, with a uh, little paper slip going around it, which I'll show you actually. If you've got it on the on the remaster, which uh, I never got because I actually bought this second hand. <laughs> so that's how late I got into them. So um, yeah, yeah, I did. I didn't have the uh, the paper slip on it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's got some um, good tracks on it. This is uh, "Song Remains the Same" is on this, which is a classic. Which uh, they opened a lot of shows with. They opened up uh, the live album by the same name. That they, when I saw them at Nebworth, they opened it with it there, and um, then you got the Rain song again, a live favorite. They also played that when um, I was there. That's not one of my favorites. That just drags on a bit. I think another one that's a bit of a long track that. I could never really get into is called No Quarter, which is uh, one of the John Paul Jones ones where he's kind of uh, just all very nicely played, but I just never really hooked into it. My uh, favourite track, my favourite tracks on here actually uh, was the um, Over the Hills and Far Away, which is a really nice uh, countryish kind of uh, intro, a nice acoustic intro, a good old rocker. Uh, it does seem to tail off a bit towards the end. I've, I've always thought about that song. It's a great song, but it all feels as though it's like, oh, yeah. so like they run out of ideas halfway through the song. Uh, there's a track called The Crunge, which um, I, I saw written somewhere as this called Pseudo Soul, but it's kind of like an um, impromptu kind of jam in the studio with a bit of a. Well, I'm like rapping over the top of it by uh, Bob Plant. And then um, you've got Dancing Day as Open Side 2, which is a kind of standard, okay, standard rocker. Jamaica, which is uh, trying, to, trying to mix doo wop with reggae, um, which um, I don't think it really works. It's not really one of my favourites. Uh, then you've got uh, No Quarters on side two, No, no Quarters, and then the, the, the album closes with The Ocean, which is my my favourite track on the album, actually, I really like that track, and on the remastered version of uh, the Song of Men's Same Live album, the, that got added in, and it's brilliant, a really great version. But yeah, all in all, a um, bit, yeah, a bit weak, really, but... Um, yeah, so still, it became that. That became iconic. I mean, the same. It came at the same year as Outside the Moon. This became as equally iconic as a sleeve. That's for that orange sky. There's that. So, as for the remaster, um, there you can see that's the little paper slip that came came with it to hide hide the nakedness. And um, yeah, again, yeah, I was going to need to show these. I said that's uh, what the negative version looks like on the back. I'll take the slip off actually. Up down there. That's the negative version. Then inside you've got this spread there, the uh, as on the uh, 12 inch. And then a couple of shots of the band, one of them outside the, the Starship aircraft, and the uh, one of the shots on stage around about the time of the film, actually, somewhere probably probably is at Madison Square Garden. Now, um, like the other out, like the um, In Three Outdoor, the uh, the second disc on this is just the album again, but the outtakes have moved on, with the exception of Jamaica. Interesting, that. I don't know why. Maybe they only did one take of that altogether. So, uh, but yeah, so you just got the album normal, and then the album has outtakes and alternate versions. So um, anyway, still still worth li listening to. There's still some good stuff in there, but uh, it's only number seven in my um, Led Zeppelin ranking. It's House of the Holy from 1973. Okay, um, right, uh, number six, got me notes up here today, number six, where are we, this is where it all started, 1969, they released two albums in 1969, both really, really good, uh, I don't know how they managed it, because they were on the road all the time as well, I think this was recorded in about half an hour, <laughs> or something, it was recorded some ridiculous short time, this is the debut, Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin, sometimes known as Zep 1, but um, just 
self-titled debut. There's a front with the famous Hindenburg shot, um, treated by George Hardy, who uh, did a lot of work later with hypnosis. And then a sort of sepia shot of the band in the back, and quite still quite sixties in the way it's set up the sleeve. But yeah, it was a great great start. But th this is where a lot of the um, a lot of covers on here, to be honest, uh, although quite, they're nearly all um, credited to the band. Um, I mean, the album's up great. Good times, bad times is a great great album. I must admit, I was actually thinking the other day this might be a little bit higher in my ranking. But I, was, I actually got into this uh, when I, um, more when I was at college. I was at college in the eighties, and uh, there's a couple of guys there I knew had, uh, were in a band, and they they played lots of. Um, Blues and rock covers, and uh, they they were really into this this album, this era of um, Led Zeppelin. So they got it got played quite a lot at college, and it kind of reminds me of that era, really. But um, yeah, it's gone great. Good times, bad times, great opener. Babe, I'm gonna leave you. Which um, down here is um, credited to a traditional song, but it was actually written. <coughs> oh, excuse me, by a lady called uh, Anne Breden or Breeden, Anne Breeden. And uh, I'd heard it um, also, I mean, this is the first time I'd heard the song, but I've also heard it sing a um, song by um, John Byers, who um, did it on one of her albums. Then you've got You Shook Me, which is a Willie Dixon song, which he gets credit for on this. Then uh, you've got Days and Confused, which um, became an iconic Led Zeppelin tube. It was actually written by by um, a guy a guy called Jake Holmes and uh, I've heard the original version it's more of a folky kind of um, folk rock kind of version he does and it is the same song really and then it was just his credit to Jimmy Page he does in recent years he has uh, been credited to um, Jimmy Page I think it's on here actually on the on the I think it's now where are we Jimmy Page inspired by Jake Holmes so he gets a slight credit there but um, it, it is really his song it's just Padded out and and changed and added on really. Um, then that that became a, a centerpiece of the live show. I mean, right. I mean, I think when they reformed and did the the O2 show in London, they were, did that's where he incorporated his violin bow solo. And I mean, on the on the first live album, it's like covers a whole side, which goes on. And they mix in all these rock and roll standards. It'll come medley as part of it, mostly instrumental. Uh, say very dramatic, but yeah, it's, it was a cool thing. You got your, your uh, side two opens with your time is going to come, which is a great kind of song, almost like a gospel sounding song. Starts off with a bit of uh, organ in there. I think the only keyboard that John Paul John plays on here is organ because it mentions bass and organ. And then you got Black Mountain Side, which is um, an old um, Bert Yank, Yank song. I think it was, was it traditional? No, I can't remember now. Um, yeah, it was traditional. I think it was originally called. Down by Black Waterside, and Bert Janch from um, Pentangle arranged the version, and this is the same version that Bert Janch did pretty much. He also uh, nicked another one of Bert Janch's arrangements, <laughs> but you'll hear about that later. Uh, Communication Breakdown follows that, which is a great rock art, it's a good, nice, short, sharp. I think that was released as a single in the States. Then I Can't Quit You Baby, by which is a Willie Dixon song, he gets credit on that. And then How Many More Times, which is a bit of a mix of a few old songs. It's How Many More Years with an old Howling Wolf song. And then there's a bit in the middle where they use um, bits from The Hunter, which is an Albert King song that was written by him, and uh, Booker T and the MGs, so there's a bit of that in there as well. But uh, an interesting thing about this on the first album, they very rarely use outside musicians. Uh, on this one, the first album, we have um, a guy called Verum Jasani who plays tabla drums on Black Mountain side. So that's the first time, first album. Then they got a, a guest, but um, yeah, not not many people, not many other people appeared on, the, on their albums. So I think because uh, with particularly with uh, John Paul Jones there, if they needed another instrument, oh, Jones, you'll play it. I think that was the that was a rallying cry. Oh, Jones, you'll sort that out. Right, okay, so that's um, yeah, number six in my rundown. Now this, this, out of all the remasters, this definitely has the best uh, extra disc. Now there's the, the lovely um, re, uh, remaster sleeve there with the negative on the back, which is quite dramatic. Um, of course, would it been not? It wasn't a gatefold that first one. And that was the re, re uh, done the back and some nice um, early shots of the band there. But uh, yeah, the, the second disc on here is a, is a live, is basically a live show from uh, 1969, uh, recorded in Paris at the Paris Olympia, October the 10th, 1969, and it's absolutely brilliant. It's really good. Really captures them in that raw sort of early days. 
and then kind of pretty much where are we? Uh, yeah, they're introducing some tracks off a second album here as well, like Moby Dick's on here and um, Heartbreaker. But it is mainly uh, just tracks off the first album, and it's really good. That's really good. I mean, out of like I say, out of all the um, bonus discs and the remasters, that is uh, easily the best. Really, really good. Anyway, there you go. Number um, six in my Led Zeppelin ranking. It's Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin 1. Led Zeppelin, the first album. Okay, I'll oh, keep it in 69 for number five in my list. It's Led Zeppelin 2. There we go. This is the big one. This is the one that went stellar. Went to number one. Uh, every, pretty much everywhere in the world, I think. Uh, all their studio albums went to number one in the UK, except for the first album, which uh, only made about number nine or something, or number six, maybe. But this was um, just stellar, stellar. And a um, whole lot of love is on here, of course, with the opening track, which uh, is, of course, not really their song. It was, it was based on You Need Love by Willie Dixon. Uh, but it was based on a Muddy Waters version uh, as well as a Small Faces version. If you ever get the chance to hear, to hear the Small Faces version of um, You Need Love, it's it's whole lot of blood, really. I mean, uh, of course, you've got the on this. You've got the pagey guitar, which that really cool guitar sound he gets at the the opening chords with that classic riff. I mean, uh, I read in um, I a book years ago that um, it was uh, the whole lot of whole lot of love riff was the riff that all future riffs will be engaging on, and uh, that's fair enough. Then of course, he's got that center passage with the we use the theremin, and um, it's just really, it's really exciting stuff. I must admit. A um, few other um, covers on here. You got Lemon Song, which is a cover of a Howling Wolf song called Killing Floor, pretty much. I mean, they do embellish these tracks. They're not straight covers. You know, they they're more like you know, this kind of inspired by them. Bring It On Home, which is a Willie Dixon song, and then Moby Dick, um, which is basically a drum solo. But the intro and outro, the guitar riff, and that is an old track called uh, Watch Your Step by a guy called Bobby Parker, which I only found out about recently by accident. So. Uh, Still lots of uh, you know, covers and things nicked from uh, earlier places. But uh, yeah, the sleeve <coughs> was done by a guy called David Juniper. Uh, that's a, the, full, the full spread of the sleeve. But it's an old um, World, War, World War I sh um, photograph where he's, he's just dropped in the face of the band and a few other people and uh, added a few things. They've added a few cool shades on some of the uh, people there and uh, there are some random shots put in. Uh, the inside spread, uh, I think it's just dreadful, it's a, it's a really bad, bad airbrush job. I've, always, I've never liked that centre spread there, it just looks really... I mean, uh, it's like one of the things you do at college and, and fail. <laughs> but uh, it is what it is, I suppose. Um, yeah, David Juniper, and David Juniper was a, a mate of um, Jimmy Page's from art, art college when I was at art school, so um, that's how uh, that connection came about. Uh, so anyway, um, the remaster is um, pretty good. Yeah, the, it's actually a lighter, lighter brown on this. I mean, I know, I've, I've had this one. I've had this one for a long time. It looks like kind of lighter, lighter colour on the on the remasters. They haven't quite got that right. I don't know. Don't know what happened there. And then the uh, negative version of the back's quite interesting. Now, what they got on the uh, second disc here, the companion disc, is just um. The companion disc, nice, nice shot of them on stage there. That's pretty cool. How close to the audience they used to get back in those days. And someone wearing a tie in the audience. How cool. How cool is that? Okay, um, yeah, just some remixes of uh, rough mixes, a backing track mix, rough mix with vocal of uh, Heartbreaker. Oh, yeah, I didn't really talk too much about the other tracks. The Heartbreaker's on here, that's a great track. Heartbreaker, you've got uh, What Isn't What Should Never Be, which is a pretty good track. Ramble On. Which um, is a bit of a classic of theirs. Um, yeah, but um, Living Loving Made, which um, segs straight in after Heartbreaker. But uh, yeah, there's an interesting shot of the band there, Portraits. But uh, yeah, it's a um, good album. Got them, you know, got them on the track. I mean, I'd, uh, I, I didn't really get into it that much at the time. I remember when I borrowed, I borrowed it off somebody, and I thought, yeah, I can't see what all the fuss is about. But I don't know, you know, I was only young and these don't know, but uh, I've got, I got into it a lot, a lot more in, year, in later years. It was one of my brother's favourite, that. I think um, when my brother passed away, um, he requested Ramble On, he played at his funeral, so um, that, was quite, that was quite touching. Okay, moving on, number four, my rundown here. This is one that's not usually that high in a lot of the rankings, particularly the ones I've seen. So, <laughs> the sleeve is filthy now. 
Who, who ever thought, well, why did he print things and, and uh, uh, produce these white sleeves? Anyhow, 1976, presents. Um, around about the same time, it's another hypnosis sleeve. Um, not really. That, I mean, the sleeve, I was kind of into it at the time, because I was just a young, pretentious teenager. But in later years, not really that much into it. It's a bit, a bit crap, really. With this uh, strange object that appears... It appears everywhere, and um, actually on the spread, uh, there's all these um, shots here with this uh, little bizarre object. And I've actually seen some of these shows. They, they, these are all from um, photo libraries, quite, quite old photo libraries as well. Some of them are going back to the uh, the fifties. And uh, one interesting thing about this was in the the shot here, it's got these young teenagers there with a, a dance set record player, which is exactly the same as my, uh, the record player I used to have. That I used to play these Led Zeppelin albums on when I was a, when I was, when I was a teenager before I got my first stereo. You know, I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, though, you, there was an insert with this, but uh, I haven't got it anymore for some reason. I don't know why. But anyway, yeah. Great album. Great guitar album. This is the only Zepp album that features no keyboards. It's all um, guitar. So um, that's uh, something, a point of interest for this album. But it's just great. I just love it. It's really, really raw sounding. Um, it was recorded while uh, Robert Plant was in a wheelchair, apparently, because he had a nasty road crash when he was on holiday in Greece. And uh, I think he had a fractured ankle or something. Or he badly injured one of his legs. And he was in a wheelchair. But you can't really tell, obviously. But um, it's really, really sort of a uh, rocking kind of album. Really kind of cold production on it. Kind of a harsh production, which uh, I, can't, I think really works. It's got uh, Achilles Last Stand, the track that opens it, which is one of my favourite Zep, Zep tracks, a bit, a bit of an epic, which is really good, which they also played when I saw them at Nebeth, which I was very pleased about. Uh, and then you've got um, Hot... Well, hang on, if I use... Because I've got the insert anymore, I can't remember the tracks, so I'll have a look at the uh, the remaster to find out a track listing. I should know it, but uh, I obviously don't. There's the, the negative... Maybe negative of the front shot, which is quite interesting. Yeah, it's got uh, where are we now? Yeah, because that's on for your life. Royal Orleans, that uh, complete side one. Nobody's fault but mine. Open side two, which they also played in that with. Now that is a, uh, a take on. Um, it was actually nice. That's actually called. It's nobody's fault but mine. By who the hell did that one? Blind Willie. Blind Willie Johnson, I think it was. Not Blind Lemon Jefferson or the other. Um, uh, Blind blues um, artist, but yeah, um, that opens side two, which is pretty, it's pretty good for one of those um, call and response kind of things. Um, Candy Store Rock, Hot Sun for Nowhere, which is kind of, kind of nice, kind of groovy, funky tracks, and then T for One, which is a typical slow blues number. Um, a, that's what you got on the insert of the, uh, the vinyl, just a couple of shots of the, the object. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great album. I really got into it. Um, uh, particularly Killy's Last Stand, which is the real standout on it. And uh, I think because I didn't have any keyboards, it had a real rocking sound about it. It's quite heavy. It's a lot of guitar overdubs. Um, but yeah, really, really enjoyable album. Um, I've already uh, shown you the. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, the remaster. And it's uh, that's the replicating the spread in the middle there. Now, what did what did the extra extra track on the extra uh, disc on this have on it? Let's get the insert out again. <laughs> I'm well prepared today, aren't I? Okay, the extra disc two. Oh yeah, it has uh, la, 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 la. Royal Orleans, something, something for nowhere. Killy's Last Stand, just a different version under its original name. Two ones are one. For your life, yeah. So you got five of the tracks. Um, just alternate takes. Five, five of the tracks, really. Uh, a nice shot of the band um, all dressed as teddy boys there. I seem to remember some shots around that. I remember around 1975, then that, that was taken. Shot nice shot of the band on stage there. But uh, yeah. So, there you go, presents from 1976. Oh, yeah, the um, title is Embossed. It's on the top there. Same on the same on the album. Uh, you can't quite see it. So, that, that, that was quite cool. So, there we go. That's... Uh, that's number four in my rundown. Right, into the top three, you know. Okay, number three. This is the one that uh, tends to feature at number one in most lists. It's their biggest selling album by a long way. And, uh, and their most famous album. Uh, it's um, the untitled fourth album. That everyone calls Led Zeppelin 4 now. Uh, it also went under the name of the Runes album. Um, because um, each band member gave himself a mystic rune to identify them. 
And uh, there was lots of, con- uh, not controversy, but lots of outcry in the record company because they didn't have the band's name, the album's name at all on the sleeve. I mean, this is um, Gatefold. So you've got that front and back. So now shot, shot taken in um, Birmingham, somewhere in Birmingham. Uh, that tower block at the back there, it's called Salisbury House or Salisbury Tower. I don't know whether it's still there or not, but that was the actual shot. They found this painting of this um, guy with all the sticks on his back in an antique shop, stuck it on this um, wall of a partly demolished building and uh, just took the shot, which I think is pretty cool. Of course, you can't can't tell where it is. And then the inside of this painting by Barrington, a guy called Barrington Colby, called The Hermit, which is all very Lord of the Ringsy. Uh, see it that way? So and there's no in, no no information there at all either. So that was the sleeve. Yes, you have to look on the um, the insert to find out more about it. And there, the track listing and the four symbols to represent uh, the band members. Ow! Oh, now this is another one that has a guest appearance, and the the guest appearance on here is by Sandy Denny, lead singer of Fairport Convention at the time, and she appears on one track called "The Battle of Evermore." She's third track side one. She was given by the band. Her own runic symbol, so there you go, Sandy Denny. So it's up there on the track as well. So yeah, this is like I say, their most famous, uh, famous. It's got their most famous song on it, "Say Away to Heaven." Um, Black Dog opens it up. That, um, call and response type of track, which is very similar to Young Man Blues. Uh, rock and Roll is a rock and roll track. Uh, so that's the second track, and uh, those two again constant. Um, the concert staples, they uh, tend to play them at all the shows, use his encores perhaps. Rock and roll is just ma- mainly basically a reworking of uh, uh, Keep a Knocking, the old uh, Little Richard song. If you listen to them back to back, you can see the similarities. Battle of Evermore is a kind of a folky kind of song, playing you know, lots of mandolin, which is really, really cool. That's the one that uh, Sandy Denny appears on. Stay Over to Heaven, I don't need to talk about. Um, apart from the, another one that had a bit of a uh, plagiarism problem in court uh, sounds a bit like uh, Taurus by the band Spirit, which I do agree it does sound very much like it, or part of it does anyway. But it's, it is definitely one of those songs I don't really need to ever hear again. Side two is a lot better, I think. Uh, Mr. Mountain Hop starts it up with that lovely um, electric piano uh, rhythm. That was another song they played when I saw them at Nebworth. Um, Four Sticks is a kind of haunting kind of rhythm to it, it's, it's quite a unique little song. Kind of folky or tribal. Has a, there's a lot of a bit of world music uh, influence in there. Going to California, just a nice standard acoustic. And then uh, my my favourite track on the album is uh, "When the Levy Breaks," a uh, final track, which um, is uh, an old track, an old song, an old blues song by uh, Kansas uh, Kansas Joe and Memphis Mini, who both wrote the song. But Memphis Mini is the only one that gets a credit on on the track on the Zep album. But um, but yeah, like I say, biggest selling album, most famous album, uh, Zep, everyone called it Zep4, oh Zep4, yeah, okay. So um, that's that, the uh, the remaster is pretty cool, <laughs> the back's really cool, isn't it? really bizarre, it's quite, quite creepy. Uh, there's the front of course, and then the, uh, the centre spread there with the, the Hermit, which I'm not really a fan of myself really, it's kind of like a... One of the things you do at school, I think. <laughs> anyway, there you go. Uh, I love the shot on here. That that shot, um, I've been concert, it's on the size of the That was actually taken in Australia on their only ever Australasian tour, uh, which I think was 72, no, 72? 70, oh, 71, 72. They played New Zealand as well. They only had, did one ever show in New Zealand that was on the tour. That actually um, features on the book cover. So it's going to be featured in a, a later video of mine. But uh, there you go. Now, what's the uh, what's the second disc? I think it features. Two. I think they've done the same again. Yeah, the second disc features um, the whole album again, but um, different takes of, the, of all the songs. Graphic Breaks was the name of the studio that did the sleeve, by the way. Um, or Graph Breaks. Is it Graph Breaks? I can't remember now. Anyway. It's either graphic breaks or graph breaks. Uh, I don't know of any individual people that are involved. It's probably created on the inside, but uh, can't be bothered. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, that's number three, my rundown. Uh, Led Zeppelin 4 from 1971. Uh, bigger, uh, biggie. Okay, and, um, number two, my Zep rundown is from 1975. This is when I really first got into them. 
the first album I got into them proper, and it's a uh, physical graffiti. That lovely, um, I was called Peter Coriston artwork. I, I mentioned him when I was doing the Rolling Stones rundown. He, uh, this is the one with the uh, die cuts, different interchangeable windows. It's getting a bit, a bit frail now. I've had this uh, pretty much since it came out, um, so it's, gonna, it's kind of falling apart a bit. I have to get some glue out, fix it. Um, well, yeah, fantastic album. It's a double album. Famously a double album. Uh, the shot there is, uh, I've actually researched where that's taken. Where is it now? I've written it down. It was taken in New York, obviously. It's one of the um, famous brownstone apartment blocks. Um, East, 8th Street, East 8th Street and St Mark's Place. That's where that is. I don't know the exact numbers of the building, but uh, that's where that's taken. Um, then we've got the nighttime shot on the back. I think it's pretty cool. But anyway, yeah, great album. Like I say, double album. Um, it was one of those um, where they didn't have enough music for a uh, double album, but they hadn't had too much for a single album, so they just padded out with outtakes. So there's quite a lot of tracks on here are outtakes from previous sessions, which is pretty good. I mean, there's some of them are, are, that become sort of standard tracks and they're just, just now associated with this album, to be honest. Even though one of them is the title track from Houses of the Holy, which wasn't used on the Houses of the Holy album. Uh, that's on, I uh, can't remember what side it's on now, is it side two? But it opens up with a custard pie. Yeah, it's got this lovely, um, lovely uh, sort of like um, ransom note style um, uh, titles there. So chopped out of different typefaces. Yeah, so it opens a custard pie, and this is side one. Then you got the Rover, this is the second track here, which is my favourite Zep track. I'll just throw that one in there. Uh, now that that was an outtake from House of the Holy as well. Um, side side one closes within my time of dying, which uh, is credited to the band again. Which is, but it was it's an old traditional folk song. It was actually um, recorded by uh, Bob Dylan on his first um, on, on his first album. So a, of course they expand it out. It's got some lovely slide guitar on it. So it's a really expanded version of the song. But um, again, credited just to the band. Houses of the Holy, as I mentioned before, and then you've got Trampled Underfoot and Kashmir, which are just two classic Zep tracks, really. They're just really good. Play them both on a solo and Nedworth, it's really, really good. Um, Trampled Underfoot is that kind of, it's almost a disco beat. It's really good. Now, that is um, inspired by uh, another song, but I can't remember who what it is. Remember, uh, Robert Plant mentioned it. Uh, at the, the reef, the, when they reformed for that gig at the O2, um, but I can't remember. I can't remember what it was. Kashmir is that famous that, that ascending chord thing with the that's kind of a Middle Eastern kind of sound to it, which is um, really cool. And the second album starts off with In the Light. Now, was In the Light an outtake? No. Limited Light wasn't. Bronny Orr was an outtake. Bronny, now, Bronny Orr is another one that's nicked from um, uh, old. Uh, what's it? No, no, actually, was it? No, it wasn't that one. Sorry, I'm thinking about something else now. Down by the Seaside, which is the third track, was probably the weakest song on, on the album, or my, must say my least favourite. That that was an outtake from Zep 4, which as you can imagine wouldn't really fit in with that. Ten Years Gone is a great track, it's one of my favourite um, Zep tracks that came and um, comes on the uh, last track on Side 3. They played that at Nebworth. Side 4 starts with Night Flight, which was an outtake. That was an outtake from Zep 4, I think. Uh, Bronny O, by the way, Bronny O is an instrumental, acoustic instrumental, um, which is an outtake from Zep 3. So that's why I'm getting confused with the. Anyway, uh, Once on Song, which is another great song. Um, that's a second track on side two. Booger with Stew, which is another outtake from uh, Zep 4, which is uh, based on a track by. Um, oh, I can't remember now. I can't remember who did the original. Um, but uh, Ian Stewart appears on that. And that's an outtake from Zep 4, because of course Ian Stewart, I didn't did mention, appears on the track Rock and Roll on um, Zep 4, so he's a, he, that album has two two guest appearances. But with this being an outtake, he doesn't officially appear as a guest on this, he just appears in, the, in an outtake. Black Country Woman is also an, an outtake from... Where's that from? How's the Holy, yeah. And um, then Sick Again closes the album. That's another great track. That's another one they played in Nebworth and another one of my favourites. So, um, there you go. So, yeah, this was a really, really cool, really, really cool album to, to get. And um, like I say, one of, the, one of the probably the first one I actually bought myself. You've got this, all these little inserts, the, the two inserts it comes in. There's lots of different pictures of the band and friends and all kinds of various 
photographs. It's quite similar in a way to um, Exile on Main Street, the way it's all kind of put together with the images. And then you can slot them in. I'm not going to try it on this because it's a bit fragile at the moment. You slot them into the different windows. And uh, there you go. Uh, now, they've beautifully recreated this with the uh, the remaster. Um, look at that, it's absolutely lovely. And just, and it still works the same. Still, um, I'll have to look after this, so it's a bit too, a bit too fragile. Still works the same. Or on this one, you've got three discs. You've got the original, the original two with the album, and then the uh, the extra disc. And there's the, uh, whoop, there's the extra disc. The uh, negative version of the, the the sleeve. Now the extra disc, the extra disc details is just again outtakes and bits and pieces. That's written on the inside of the insert. Uh, yeah, you've got a thing called Brandy and Coke, which is a um, rough mix of Trampled on the Foot. You've got Sick Again, which is an earlier version. In My Time of Dying, which is uh, an initial rough mix. House of the Holy, uh, which is a rough mix version. Um, Everybody Makes It Through, which is In the Light, in its original title. Boogie with Stew, which is a different, a different mix. And then Driving Through Kashmir, which is a Kashmir Roof Orchestra mix. To be honest, I haven't really played this very often, so I can't, can't really tell you what it what it's all like. But uh, you just, I think when these came out, they, they, they weren't released all at once. They were kind of gradually released through the year, uh, usually two at a time. But um, physical being uh, obviously being the hardest one to put together, that came out by itself hard part way through but uh, anyway there it is it's uh, number two in my Led Zepp ranking here physical graffiti from 1975 which means uh, if you've been doing the numbers <laughs> counting number one is uh, their third release my favourite Zepp album at the moment Led Zeppelin 3 which is definitely the first one I really got into um, this is a really old knackered copy that I also bought second hand but it's one of the original pressings has the uh, the rather complicated uh, if I can find the find the thing this kind of weedy thing that goes around I think it should should still go around hang on does it oh, it's stuck anyway you can see it has a little die cut window and there's like a little disc that spins round inside hmm it's, it's like it's stuck anyway I'll have a look at that and try and try and fix it but uh, yeah the, the sleeve was done by um, a, guy, a guy called Richard Drew. It went by the name of Zacron, and it's a, it's quite an you know an intricate kind of um, sleeve actually. It's quite different to a lot of their other stuff. Never been quite sure of a Led Zeppelin um, font use. There's like a hand drawn kind of thing on that, but um, it's not too bad. Back shot uh, portraits of the band are there, and then the gatefold, just more of the same really. Just all these little um, images of lots of Zeppelins there. Some. Uh, Corn cobs that look that could be could look like zeppelins. A few other bits and pieces, biplanes and uh, birds, and there's lots of uh, repeated uh, images on here. Bits of castles and that. But um, yeah, interesting. And um, with this being the original, it's the one that has the, the famous inscriptions on the runoff on the vinyl, which are from quotes from uh, Alistair Crowley, which uh, Jimmy Page was into. So mote it be, and do what thou wilt. There on the on the runoff. But, um, but yeah, shame. I, I hadn't noticed that this that my wheel wasn't turning around still. I'll have to, I'll have to fix that. But yeah, but this this is fantastic. It's got some great stuff on it. It's got lots of uh, this, this, this was often referred to as the folk album. But there's still still some blistering uh, rock on here as well. It opens up with the um, um, immigrant song that was just straight in, which became a concert opener for a while, which is really really good. Then you've got uh, Friends, which is one of the acoustic songs. And you've got this bizarre the, um, uh, kind of you know immigrant song finishes with this. And you've got this synthesizer sound. You go down sort of mystic kind of um, acoustic guitar playing, and then Friends moves in. Lots of keyboard, lots of synth on that. Then that um, the uh, synthesizer finishes that song and kind of winds down. And you hear this droning kind of sound, which then breaks into. Um, Celebration Day, third track in with this great guitar intro, and that's one of their classic rock rock songs, which they did at Nebworth, of course. Uh, that's followed by Since I've Been Loving You, which is uh, probably their uh, most popular blues number, although it's slightly nicked a bit from Moby Grape when they had a song called, um, what was it called? Never, I think it was called. Um, I can't remember what album it was on, but um, 
that was another one of those American bands that they played with back in the 60s, along with Spirit and a lot of other people. Uh, so it just makes you wonder where, where you know where they get these from. But um, side two is the one where there's more more traditional and uh, used material from. You got Gallows Pole, which is a traditional song, which was originally called uh, "The Maid Freed from the Gallows," um, which is pretty good. I do a really good rocking, folky rocking version of it. Um, what else have you got here? You got um, a, uh, a tangerine. I can't remember the order actually. What's the order of this? Oh, I've got this on the back here. Da 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 da. French celebration. Da 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 da. Gospel. You got um, Tangerine next, which is um, one of their classic acoustic numbers. Followed by That's the Way. Those two are really, two really really nice um, Zep Zep tunes. Then you got the Bronnie R Stomp, which is the one that I was getting mixed up with before, which is the one that's also taken from a uh, Bert Jansch arrangement. So um, yeah, that was a, another one that they um, it was got. It was a called what was it called? The Waggers. The Wagoner's Lad, or The Wagoner's Lad, I think it was called originally. But they just adapted it into the Bronny R Stump. And then uh, Hats Off to Roy Harper, which closes the album, which is a bizarre song. Some strange mixing and editing in that, and the, the production. Uh, which is um, an old, uh, gosh, who recorded that? Booker White song called Shake Em On Down. So that was uh, heavily influenced by that. So that was... Um, so side side two is the one that's used lots of early material, but it's just a you know, really really great album. Here's the um, remaster version, looking a bit cleaner. My uh, old ones, uh, old ones a bit knackered there. So, uh, again, I bought the one I got second hand back in, back in the late seventies. But on this one, I'm sure that the uh, the wheel does actually work. Yeah, the wheel does actually work on this one. There we go, spinning around nicely. So again, it's a, it's a really really nicely reproduced. Miniature of the original album, um, but it's got the reverse out verse on the back. Now, what's on the second disc on this? Uh, I think the second disc is just loads of outtakes again. There's the uh, the back shot of the band is now in the middle on this, but yeah, they have the outtakes on here on, um, on the second disc. Yeah, a different, a different mix of the immigrant song, uh, an instrumental version of uh, Friends. So, yeah, I think it just basically go right through. Yeah, there's a track called Bathroom Sound. I don't know what that is. That's the way Jennings Farm Blues, which is um, uh, an old an old track. Um, Key to the Highway and Trouble in Mimes, couple of, they're just blues standards that are never made. They're just rough mixes. They never made the album. But um, interesting, yeah, great album. I mean, um, with Led Zeppelin, it's, it's very, very difficult to sort of decide what your best one is. But... Uh, I think with me, it was just more, more about nostalgia than because I don't really tend to listen to that much these days. You know? But when I do, it's usually either physical graffiti or Zep 3 that I, uh, I reach out for. So um, there you go. So I think that uh, brings this ranking to a close. So um, yeah, I think I managed to fit everything in there. There's quite a lot to talk about with Zep. It's all crammed in over a space of 11 years, I think, 11 or 12 years. So um, yeah, they're quite uh, they're quite prolific in there in there compared to today's bands who were anyway. And they uh, did those famous long long live shows. I think when I saw them, they're on stage about three and a half hours. Although saying that, <laughs> I've actually heard a um, a tape of the uh, the show, and there was lots of pauses in between the songs where they're having sound issues. So that obviously p padded the uh, the hours out a bit. But anyway, yeah, they were one of those bands that uh, everyone was into in the seventies, myself included. I was um, like I say, I don't listen to as much now as I used to, but uh, they'll always be there, and I do have a lot of their stuff. I've um, got all the box sets and things, and their live albums and DVDs, and lots of books and things. So um, yeah, they've uh, they have meant quite a lot to me over the years. But um, and that that was uh, how I ranked the studio album. So there you go. So hope you enjoyed that. Uh, obviously, this is my personal ranking. Everyone else's is different, um, so I'd be quite happy to read. Any comments in the box below? So, there you go. So, thank you for being there once again, and uh, I will catch you next time. So, bye for now. <laughs>